Okay, so thank you and, and welcome everybody to the webinar on meta-analysis of time to event data. First of all, I'll, I'll talk about the analysis of time to event data with an individual single trial. So I'll spend a bit of time talking about standard methods of analysis. And then I'll talk about specifically the meta-analysis of time to event data. And I'm talking here about um, aggregate data time to event um, analyses where we're interested in extracting aggregate or summary data from trial publications. Um, there are many advantages of collecting individual participant data from trials that report time to event data, but I'm not covering those issues today, but it's something to consider um, for, for this particular area. And you'll hear me talk about a lot about estimating the log hazard ratio and its variance throughout today's webinar. So the hazard ratio is the, the treatment effect measure that we're interested in when we're doing a meta-analysis of time to event data. And the statistics, log hazard ratio and variance is what we're trying to extract from each of those individual trials that are going into the meta-analysis. There is a practical um, handout available for you to download and also solutions to the practical. So I won't be going into that today, um, but they're there for you to, to have an opportunity to, to go through an example of extracting data um, that you might want to do before doing a meta-analysis. So throughout the, the webinar, you'll see a number of equations. They've been highlighted in red because they are there for, for completeness, really. You don't need to be um, too concerned about these, these equations. It's not essential to understand the, the algebra behind them. Uh, they're just there for completeness. OK, so first of all, analysis of time to event data from a single trial. Time to event data arise when we're measuring the length of time between a particular well-defined starting point and the occurrence of some event. Examples of starting points might be uh, date of diagnosis of a particular disease, date of surgery, or date of randomization, which is going to be the, the most appropriate starting point in a randomized control trial. Examples of events of interest will be death. So this is a very common event that we're interested in, in particularly in oncology trials. Um, and we often refer to the outcome of interest there as overall survival. But it doesn't have to be death. We might be interested in recurrence of a, a tumour, or we might also be interested in a good event, such as remission of a disease. So here's an example for patient A. They're randomised into a trial on the 1st of January 2012. So that's the well-defined starting point. The patient's then followed up during the trial, and they experience the event of interest, which is death here, on the 31st of December 2013. So the time to event for patient A is 730 days. Now, a, um, a feature of time to event data is that often the event of interest isn't observed on all subjects. Reasons for this might include that the patient drops out of the study during the, the trial, or it could be that the study will end before the event has occurred for, for particular patients. However, what we have is information for that patient. We do know how long they were followed up for without the event being observed, and we can use that information in, in our analysis. So these individuals for whom the event isn't observed are called censored observations. So here's an example for, for patient B, randomized into a trial on the 1st of February 2012. They're followed up for the, for, um, during the trial, and the study ends on the 31st of January 2013, but patient B hasn't yet experienced the event of interest. So the date of censoring for this patient would be 31st of January 2013. All we know for this patient is that they're event free for that period of time of 365 days. And we know that their event will occur sometime in the future, but we don't know that date. Now, an important assumption we make when using the standard methods that I'm talking about today for analysing time to event data is that the censoring mechanism is independent of the failure time mechanism, or in other words, that the, the censoring is non-informative. So censoring needs to be uh, unrelated to prognosis, and this is going to be 
most important if censoring is more likely in one group than another. Uh, so as an example, um, censoring because a study ended, as I explained in the previous slide, that would be independent of prognosis because we're pre-specifying the, the study end date and it's unrelated to prognosis. However, a patient that drops out of a study because they're, they're too unwell to attend a clinic visit, that is potentially related to the prognosis of that patient. And that is potentially um, informative censoring and might require more complex methods of analysis, which we're not dealing with today. So when we're dealing with time to event data, time is obviously a, a continuous variable. So why do we need to, to use special methods of analysis? Why can't we just analyze the time to event as a continuous response variable and undertake a meta-analysis looking at the difference in mean, means as we would using um, any continuous response variable? Well, the main issue is, is because of the censoring. Um, we have to deal with that in our analysis. We could potentially um, look at ways of doing this. We could assume that the censored observations are in fact uncensored observations and just incorporate the time as a continuous response variable. But this is going to underestimate the average survival time. So we don't want to do that. We could alternatively ignore those censored observations. Um, but of course, what we're doing there is throwing away valuable information and this approach is inefficient. Um, and the other, the, the other feature of time to event data is it's often very skewed as well. So standard methods of analyzing continuous response variable data might not be the, the most appropriate anyway. We might think about analyzing the data as a binary response variable. So just looking at whether or not the event of interest occurred and ignoring information about time. And that might be an option if um, events are likely to occur very early on, as they might do for acute liver failure, if the event is rare, and if lengths of follow-up are similar between patients in the trial. And it's going to be um, something reasonable to do if we're interested in whether or not the event occurs at all, rather than interested in exploring how long it takes for the event to, to uh, to occur. However, if an appreciable portion of the patients do experience the event, and that event's likely to take a considerable amount of time, for example, looking at um, death over the next five years, and if we're interested in actually looking at the time it takes for an event to occur and whether or not a treatment um, ex extends this time, then looking not only at how many patients have the event, but also incorporating information about how long after the treatment that event occurs gives us a much more sensitive assessment. So there are lots of approaches we can take to analyze time to event data or survival data. I'm going to cover three of the most common approaches um, that you'll see in the medical literature. Uh, and the first of those is Kaplan-Meier survival curves. So this is a, a graphical method to display what's called the survival function. Um, estimated from a set of data. And the survival function gives us information about the, the probability of surviving uh, up to certain time points um, during the, the study. The, the Kaplan-Meier survival curve is plotting on the y-axis the, the proportion surviving and on the x-axis the, the time. So the top, the top example on this slide here, that the time is measured in years and the proportion is surviving um, is given in values from zero to one. And the curve will, will always start at the value of one or 100% depending on the, on the time scale. And that's at time zero. And this is where all patients are alive and event free. So they have 100% of 100% chance of surviving um, to, to, the, to that time point. You'll notice that the curve steps down each time uh, an event occurs and this will tail off towards zero. And the, the poorer survival is reflected by a curve that drops um, more steeply towards zero. So we can look at the shape of these, these curves to look at, um, to make inferences and, and summary, summaries are, are about the prognosis of, of patients. You'll notice on the, the top curve, there are little tick marks on that curve. And they are indicating where censoring has occurred. So they, they are censored observations. And on the, the bottom curve on this slide, 
um, you'll notice at the bottom of the curve, there are two rows of numbers called uh, number at risk. And this gives us valuable information. It tells us how many patients are event free and still at risk of experiencing the event at these individual time points. So the Kaplan-Meier curves allow us to visually um, see how the survival experience compares between groups, but it doesn't actually tell us whether that difference is statistically significant or not. So the log rank test is a statistical test that we can use um, to complement this and to test the null hypothesis that there's no difference between the populations in, in the probability of an event at any time point. Um, it's a non-parametric approach, so we're not making any assumption about the shape of the survival curve or the distribution of those survival times. And importantly, it's taking this centering into account and is looking for differences between those curves across the whole of the time period, not just at specific time points. Um, so it's using up all of that information in order to, to test those differences. So the test is comparing the total number of events that we observe in the study against what we would expect to see, assuming that there's no group effect. And I'm just talking here about two groups. Um, so at each event time point in the sample, so these are denoted by T1 to TK, the expected number of events is calculated for group A. Firstly, um, by calculating the the risk of an event for the whole group at this time. So this is the, the number of events in sample at TJ divided by the number at risk in sample at TJ. And then multiplying that by the, the number at risk in group A at that particular time point TJ. So that gives us the, expected, the, the number of events we would expect to see at this time point TJ if there's no group effect. So if the groups are, are the same. We then um, add up all of these expected events across all of those time points for group A to give us the total number of events expected. And these are then compared to the total number of observed events for group A. And that difference is then compared against a, a chi-square distribution um, to, to measure the strength of evidence against the null hypothesis of, of no difference between groups. So the final method of analysis that I'm covering today, very briefly, is um, the Cox regression model or Cox proportional hazards regression model. So this is the most commonly used regression model for analyzing time, time to event data. And it allows us a, a way to explore the effect of, of several variables or covariates that we want to explore on the times to events. So these are de denoted in that model by um, covariate effects of X1 to, to XK. And what we're doing in this approach is we're regressing the, the hazard at time, time t. Um, and this, the hazard function is, is the risk of event at a particular time point. So we're regressing that on these risk factors, risk factors of interest. Um, and we can then obtain effect sizes based on these results. The, the value h0 to t here is, is the underlying um, hazard function, or sometimes called the, the baseline hazard. And it's just the probability of the event when all of these explanatory variables, x1 to xk, take a value of zero. Now, we're making it an, an important assumption in this model, and that is an assumption of proportional hazards. Um, and that just means that the, the hazard function for any two individuals at any, two, any point in time is, is proportional. Um, so if you imagine an individual on a treatment group has a risk of death at some initial time that's twice as high as that of an individual on control, then at all later times, the risk of death remains twice as high as well. So we're assuming this, this constant, um, pr this proportional hazards. So a positive sign for any of those regression coefficients B1 to BK in the model means that the hazard or the risk of the event at that time point is, is higher for subjects with higher values of that variable. So I've just 
describe very briefly there three of the most common approaches for the analysis of time to event data that you'll come across in the medical literature. Uh, so the Kaplan-Meier curve is a graphical representation of a survival function, displaying the probability of surviving at certain time points. The log rank test then gives us a statistical test comparing those survival experiences of, of groups across the whole time period. And then finally, the Cox regression technique um, models the hazard function or risk of the event. So when we're interpreting survival analyses and when we're under undertaking meta-analyses of time to event data, the effect measure that we're primarily interested in is the hazard ratio. So just to recap um, on what I've just mentioned, the hazard is the chance that at any given moment in, in, in the time frame, the event will occur given that it hasn't already done so. So it's very, very often um, referred to as the instantaneous risk of the event occurring. And the hazard ratio is simply a measure of the relative hazard in two groups. Um, so we're just simply taking a ratio of hazard of one group compared to another. So let's suppose we want to compare treatment compared to control and we want to look at the, the risk of, of death in these groups. Then we could calculate the hazard ratio, which is the, the hazard in the treatment group at a particular time divided by the hazard in the control group at a particular time. So it's just a, a hazard ratio and it has a similar kind of um, interpretation as an odds ratio or risk ratio, only we're talking about hazards here rather than odds or risks. The, the hazard ratio can take any value greater than zero. Values between zero and one indicate that the the treatment group are at a decreased hazard compared to the control group. A hazard ratio equal to one indicates that the hazard is the same for both of these groups. And finally, the hazard ratio greater than one indicates that the, the treatment group are at an increased hazard compared to, to control. So a hazard ratio of what, not 0 0.5 uh, means that there's a halving of hazard in the treatment group compared to control. And hazard, of two, hazard ratio of two would mean that there's a doubling of hazard of the event in the treatment group. Okay, so on this slide here, we've got a, um, a Kaplan-Meier curve comparing the survival probability for a treatment group in red and a control group in black. And what I'd like you to do is just have a look at that survival curve and answer the question, what is the likely hazard ratio, do you think? comparing treatment to control for the outcome of overall survival in this example. Do you think it's greater than one, equal to one, or less than one? I'll give you a few minutes to, to answer that. Thank you. 45% have answered a high hazard ratio higher than one, and that is the, the correct answer. Um, so if you look at the, the survival curve, you can see that the, the um, survival probability for treatment group is consistently lower than the survival group in the control group across all of the time. So that suggests that the, the, the prognosis on treatment group is much worse than on, on treatment group than control. So there's a, a higher risk of or hazard of, of the event of interest on treatment group. And if we're comparing treatment to control, that would translate then to a, to a hazard ratio greater than one. So it's really important when you're interpreting hazard ratios and, and Kaplan-Meier curves to make sure that you understand the, the direction to, of how the hazard ratio has been calculated um, and how that relates to, to the, the prognosis um, displayed in the Kaplan-Meier curve. 